Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim from L'Oreal TV and L'Oreal Radio Live uh, with James Jacob Prash in England. Um, Jacob, uh, one of the believers asked the question, when will the peace of Naom uh, come? And that's referring to chapter 1, verse 15. Okay. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows. For never again will the wicked one pass through you. He's cut off completely. There are two stages to this happening. First of all, it is a direct reference to the fourth servant song of the book of Isaiah. The fourth servant song of Ishayahu Hanavi of Isaiah. Look with me, please, to Isaiah Chapter 52. Verse 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation. This is the preface for what continues later on in chapter 52 and in chapter 53, prophesying by description the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, who has believed our report, to whom of, has the arm of the Lord been revealed, and so forth. So the first stage of Isaiah, of, of Nahum's peace, is the coming of the Messiah, when the gospel is preached. That term there, good news, in Hebrew is bisora, and the Septuagint, it is evangelion, translated from both languages as gospel. When the Messiah comes, dies, and raises from the dead, the good news is preached. That's the beginning of it. But obviously, its climax will be in the millennial reign of Christ and then into eternity. It has a specific meaning, as always, for Israel and the Jews, but it will apply globally to all nations and all people and to the faithful believers of the true church who be raised from the dead or raptured will co-reign with Christ during that period. But it has already begun. I've explained this many times. Perhaps we need to explain it once again. The Greek word for peace is Irene. We get the girl's name Irene. It basically means an absence of conflict. An absence of conflict is the Greek term Irene for peace. The Hebrew term, however, is not that. The Hebrew term is Shalom. Shalom. Shalom comes from the infinitive of the Hebrew verb leshalem. Leshalem. Shalom comes from leshalem. Leshalem means to pay, to fulfill, and to fill. Leshalem. To pay, to fulfill, and to fill. We have shalom because Jesus the Messiah came to leshalem. He came to pay the price for our sins. He came to fulfill the Torah. He fulfilled the law. And to fill us with his spirit. We can be in the biggest conflict of our lives and have shalom. Jesus said, Shlomi and the attendant have my peace I give to you, not like the world gives you. A believer can be in the biggest conflict of their life and have his shalom. Or somebody can be in pristine circumstances and lack it. People can never be at peace with each other until they're at peace with themselves. But people can never be at peace with themselves, except delusionally, unless they're at peace with God. The only way to have peace with God is by repentance and faith in the Messiah who came to Leshalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. Now, ultimately, his shalom will include, it will certainly include the absence of conflict. Isaiah writes this, the nations will beat their swords into pruning hooks and learn war no more. <coughs> nation will not lift up sword against nation. 
In Hebrew, it's wonderful. Lo isa goy le goy herev, lo yilmadu od mil hamar. Lo isa goy le goy herev, lo yilmadu od mil hamar. Nations, ethnic nations, will not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they any more learn war. And of course, we have that wonderful Afro-American spiritual, the, the the gospel song down by the riverside. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no more no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Ain't gonna study no war no more. Gonna lay down my burden down by the riverside. Well, this just is a wonderful worship song of, of, of black Americans, but it originally came from, from this same idea. A time is going to come when the peace of Nahum will fully be here, when Jesus reigns from Mount Zion and will rule the nations with the rod of iron. At that point, the shalom we already have within ourselves will prevail over the nations. The nations will not learn war anymore. Already, believers can have his shalom internally in a finite measure. But when Jesus returns for the millennial reign, it'll be over all the earth. And then, of course, into eternity. That is the ultimate meaning. But it's important that we understand the connection between Nahum uh, chapter 1 and Isaiah 52, the fourth servant song of Isaiah. Now then later, Jacob, in Nahum uh, 319, do we ever reach a point that we cannot be forgiven? Okay, at the end of the book of Nahum, we have to understand something. Here, Nahum very much parallels the book of Joel and the book of Revelation. He's not only speaking for his own time, he's, of course, speaking for the last days. And he makes the same kind of references to the spiritually devastated state of Jerusalem and the invasions and so forth, but even using the description of the uh, locusts, of the invading locusts, that we see in Joel, and that we see as the demon cohorts of hell with the Antichrist in the book of Isaiah. Therefore, we've got to take that into account. However, the specific verse you refer to is not talking about the people of God. It's not at that point talking about Israel or Jerusalem. That is in the beginning of the chapter, Woe to the Bloody City, completely filled with lies and pillage. It's instead talking about Assyria. Your shepherds are sleeping, O king of Assyria, which is, of course, a metaphor for the devil. In the days of Nahum, Israel was sandwiched between two rival world powers, both of which were evil. One was Egypt, and the other one was Assyria. You can go to the archaeological ruins in uh, Karnak, Egypt, which are referred to uh, Thebes in, in, in the time of, of of Nahum, and he's warning what's going to happen. Of course, at the preaching of Jonah for a season, Nineveh repented, being the capital city of Assyria. Nineveh was not destroyed to a much later point, and that is what Nahum is talking about. He's talking about the fall of Nineveh, but also he's again speaking eschatologically for the end of the age. Yes, O king of Assyria, your nobles are lying down, your people are scattered. There's no one to regather them. Satan's kingdom will be ultimately destroyed irreparably. There's no relief for your breakdown. Your wound is incurable. The judgment of God will indeed come upon Assyria. Uh, once again, just as it happened in the ancient world, so it'll happen again. We understand this even further. From the beginning of the chapter, woe to the bloody city. He's speaking there not of Jerusalem, but of Nineveh, again, the capital of Jerusalem. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Nineveh was spared due to the repentance in the time of Jonah. But now he's saying it's going to happen. Uh, Nahum chastises God's own people indeed. But he also encourages them. Now, this is important about his name, Nahum. Nahum means consoled or consolation. There's a reason that Jesus lived in Kafar Nahum, the village of the consoled or the village of Nahum. That's not to say that the prophet Nahum lived in the same place, 
but it is to say there is a reason that Jesus lived at Kafar Nahum, Capernaum, the village of the consoled. He would fulfill the prophecies of Nahum, bringing this uh, consolation and bringing this peace. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, etc. These things would take place, but also we un uh, a judgment is coming against Assyria. Bearing in mind that the king of Assyria is one of the most important metaphors or symbols of Satan in Scripture. Nahum was, in a sense, an oracle against Nineveh. Now, bearing in mind again, once again, it was the Assyrians who took the ten northern tribes of Israel into captivity. The people were looking for the revenge of God or the vengeance of God against those who plundered them and took them into captivity in 721 BC. Well, Nahum is prophesying about that, but he's prophesying about it in such a way as it's a picture of what's going to happen in the last days to the kingdom of Satan. I hope that makes some kind of sense. Okay, thank you, Jacob.